Hello everyone, welcome to day two. I am Cookie, one of the hosts here today. We're going to bring in Kerry into the room now as well. Kerry, do you want to pop your head in? Hello yeah. everyone. <laughs> day two, and wouldn't you know it? Wouldn't you know it? Day two, we're going to have such a great day today. We're going to have um, uh, Lauren and also Sarah joining us very, very soon. Please make sure you say hello in the chat room. Hey Liam, hey Harry. Hey, Felicity, please make sure that you do put your name in there and give us a big hello uh, whilst we get ready for today's session. Um, like what we do every day, I just want to make everyone aware that we are raising funds for the Australian Sports Foundation. Now, 16,000 clubs are in trouble due to COVID, and what we're trying to do is help those clubs by raising funds for the Australian Sports Foundation. So what you can do is just go to the office area right now Click on that office area and make your donation. It is uh, it is tax deductible, which is awesome. Um, so please make sure that you do that. Like we normally do in the cafe as well, please make sure you play nice, get interactive, be involved, ask plenty of questions. In the room, do not hold back. I know <laughs> why. Do not hold back. Uh, and the last thing is, is make sure you share today um, the one thing that you got out of today's session and please make sure you tag us as well. Uh, there's all the social handles and uh, we'd love you to see you uh, promote this series and these sessions across all your social links. So without further ado, oh, hello. We've got a number of different tiles going on today, don't we? There we go, that's better. Um, Kerry, I'm gonna hand over to you. How are you feeling after day one? Did you have a good day yesterday? Yeah, we had a great night last night, our opening ceremony night with Joe Griggs and Louise Savage. It was fantastic. And we're continuing on with day, well, it's day two for us, but it's actually day one of the Olympics that would have been in Tokyo. Now, if the coronavirus pandemic hadn't have descended upon us, today would have been that day, day one. And some of the sports that were competing today would have been today for medals would have been archery, judo, fencing, weightlifting, shooting, and in particular, because of our guest tonight, taekwondo and road cycling. But welcome to the Athlete Story, powered by the Cup of Life Cafe. I just want to let everyone know that this docuseries was born out of my desire to fill the void of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games when they postponed it a few months ago. And knowing that so many Australians would have been glued to their TV sets, watching the incredible performance of performances of athletes from all over the world, I wanted to be able to harness that wisdom and bring some of our greatest athletes to you, in particular our gold medalists, our world champions in Olympics and Paralympics, and I wanted to play, find a place for them to connect with you, the viewers and the fans of the sports. So that place has come to life, and here we are in the Cupper of Life Cafe, so we're really grateful for you, Cookie, to have us here over the next 17 days in total. Yay! <laughs> I'm incredibly grateful, of course, for all the athletes who are donating their time coming on and also for the Australian Sports um, Foundation. We really want to help those guys as well to help community sports. So grab yourself a cuppa, whether it's a cup of tea or a glass of wine, whatever is your fancy tonight, and sit back because nothing is off limits. Now, I want to introduce our first athlete. So Sarah, if you can turn your mic and your camera on so we can see you. You can come out of the dark. <laughs> Yay! Hi, everyone. <laughs> hey, Thanks for having me. Ah, oh, pleasure, pleasure. Now, I'm just going to read a little intro because I want to get, I want to honour you for, for what you've achieved in sport. Now, Sarah was our Olympic champion in road cycling in 2004. She was an Australian female road cyclist of the year for three consecutive years. She was a Commonwealth Games medalist, a 12-time Australian Championship medalist, um, Australian rep at eight World Champs, two Olympic Games, 204 and 208, and two Commonwealth Games, 202 and 206. She's got her own cycling school and she's a board member on the Queensland Olympic Council. And you've got a street named after you, Sarah. I'm very jealous. Louise has also got a street named after her. Welcome to the Cup of Life Cafe. Thanks, Kerry. Really excited to be here. I mean, such a great idea to really fill this void when the Olympics would have been on. So I enjoyed last night with Louise and Joe. So um, yeah, thanks for having me on tonight and look forward to seeing Lauren in the room in a minute. It's a pleasure, mate. And I just want to ask you before I bring Lauren in, the Olympics today, where, if it was on, where would you be? 
in the world and what would you be doing right now if the Olympics were on right now? Uh, if I was competing or if I was watching? Just now, just as you are right now today at your life point. Where would I'd, you be, be? I'd be right here where I am, except I'd be in the living room over there watching the TV. <laughs> so the men's road race would be on today and the women's road race is on on the second day. So, um, yeah, I would have been watching some of it, that's for sure, with all those sports that you listed that would have been competing today. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, let's get our second guest on. Lozzie, if you can unmute and put your camera on so we can see your face. I know you've had some Wi-Fi issues. But hopefully yeah. <laughs> There she is! Yes. Yes. Hi! You made it! <laughs> Hi! <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, my webcam. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I, know, I know. We were just mucking around for like the last second to get Lauren on. So, um, yeah, that's that's live. Yeah, live webcams. What Live TV. God. Painful, painful. We made it. We made it. Now, I want to give you um, your intro because obviously you've achieve some incredible things now i call loza lauren our little fighting ninja. <laughs> and i say little because she's five foot five and i'm six foot almost six foot one so to me anybody's little but and you fought in the under or well, the 49 kilo class in taekwondo yeah, at the sydney man won your gold medal and that's where the sport made its debut view and you were the only one um, you're one of the only three Australian women to win an individual gold medal along with Kathy Freeman and Susie O'Neill at those games. So that's a pretty special achievement. You've also got a string of international titles. I just can't, we don't have enough time to go through them all and achieve <laughs> achievements, including also 12 national championship titles. Um, you were the 2000 Taekwondo Australia Fighter of the Year and you're a third Dan black belt. Third Dan? Third Dan? Yeah, is that the yep, third Dan? Go up in that. Oh, you can go right up to like ninth, Dan. But often when you're fighting, people just sort of get to first Dan or second or whatever. But between each Dan level, it goes up a certain amount of years. So like one year and then for the next Dan grading, you've got to wait two years, then three years. And so the people that are like eighth or ninth Dan are just, you know, grandmasters. And they're probably about 50, 60. <laughs> <laughs> At least. <laughs> now you're also a regular on the speaking circuit um, because I've been following you We're, uh, from company to company for about the last 15 years. We speak at very, very similar places. But you've also got a bachelor in naturopathy, bachelor health in health science and naturopathy. Yeah. <laughs> you're currently complete completing your PhD in lifestyle practices and the mindset of elite elite athletes. So we're going to have to call you Dr. Loz soon. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Loz. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not there yet, but yeah, Dr. Log sounds good. <laughs> now, where would you have been if the Olympics were going to be on? Like, would you have been home right now? Would you have been out at a pub watching it on the on the you know TV screens? Where would you have been? Yeah, I would have been like Sarah. I would have been in my lounge room, I reckon, um, just watching. Especially with the Taekwondo, like I would have had my kids around me going, "You've got to watch this," and you know, just you know. So today would have been the the lighter weight divisions. Um, so the lightest male and lightest female weight divisions, and that would have been my day as well. So, yeah, I always get really excited watching it. There's been so many rule changes. Like I'm really not really up to date with all of them. It seems like every, you know, games that comes around. So, you know, it looks very different to when I competed and it, and it would at, at Tokyo as well. Now, I want to take you both back, you know, just to the beginning of your journey before we fast forward all the way through to the gold medal. But, Sarah, I was reading today that from the age of 12, you dreamt of representing Australia and winning a gold medal. Did you know at that age what the sport was going to be that you wanted to win the gold medal in? No, I didn't even know road cycling existed, you know, with the curly handlebars and the skinny tyres. Um, but I do remember watching the Barcelona Olympics and just I was just so taken with the athleticism, even at 12, and just the pride that everyone felt with all the effort they had put in and the training they'd put in. And I was like, man, I'd love to do that. Um, I was a sporty kid. I did all sorts of sports, um, cross-country running, basketball, little athletics, dancing, um, horse riding. Um, but it wasn't until I found cycling, which was actually through a talent identification program at my school. And I remember distinctly the teachers getting up at assembly saying, you know, we're having this um, talent identification program and we're going to test you. And so come along. It's just for a bit of fun. And um, so I thought, oh, you know, I was 
raised on a farm and I used to always ride just my little red rocket around. Mm -hmm. And so ah, I'll, I'll go along to that. And I actually started off with a beat test. Um, and because of my cross country mm -hmm. running, my endurance was quite good. And then we did a vertical jump test and um, I was hopeless at that. So I guess I never would have been a track sprinter like Anna. Or um, a volleyball. Or a volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you have to have a good, uh, yes, you definitely have to have a good vertical jump test for volleyball with the heights you guys jump to get that ball. Um, and then from that, uh, we did a non-bike test and um, I did that but was no good. And then someone pulled out of the program because they chose 15 um, um, school students. I think it was about eight boys and seven girls. And um, they said, oh, actually, someone's pulled out. Do you want to have a go? So I had a go and I just loved it. I loved the freedom of riding, um, the exploration, the adventure, and I loved going fast. Uh, so my dad started riding as well. So he started out in a mountain bike with his sand shoes and his King G stubby shorts. <laughs> And um, it just went from there. And I guess it was just a natural progression because I just fell in love with it. Um, and uh, I realised then that because I loved it so much that um, maybe this is the sport that I could achieve my dream of winning or going to the Olympic Games. Oh, amazing. And I know that um, something happened, you know, in 19, I think it was 1999 when um, a journalist, he actually... Um, by the name of Rob Arnold, he recalls that one of the Australian Cyclists of the Year, Hank Vogels, he did something particular. He, he was listening to, um, he was at a race, and he was listening to some of the stuff going on and he was chatting to Hank and he knows how to spot a talent and he was, Hank was really responsible for getting um, Baden Cook, a pro contract, to start his career. And the women's event had been raced and the presentation was about to begin, but Vogel stopped mid-sentence. He grabbed um, Rob by the arm. He said, I want to introduce you to someone. He led him past all the women who had made it to the podium that day, including Kathy Watt, and he stopped in front of a teenage girl who'd finished fifth and he said, I want you to meet Sarah Carrigan, the winner of the Olympic gold medal in Athens. And this is in <laughs> nine. How did that make you feel? You know, I actually don't remember that. Um, but um, <laughs> Hank has always been so supportive. Um, back in the early day, um, we had um, a great training bunch um, here on the Gold Coast. And, you know, we caught up at different events. And, um, yeah, that's amazing to hear that story, actually, because I don't remember. <laughs> I, and you know what? I remember um, when I was, oh, it probably wouldn't have been too long before that. I was, um, I remember my coach used to ask me constantly, you know, what, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to do? And I was so shy that I was too embarrassed and I was too scared to say that I wanted to go to the Olympic Games because I thought that he might laugh at me or think that I was stupid and, you know, who do you think I am? Um, so it took me a little while, even though I knew inside exactly what I wanted to do, it took me a little while to um, get the courage to say, hey, this is what I want to do. So um, I don't, yeah, I would have known by that stage, I guess. Um, so it's amazing like, that he had that um I guess that, yeah, insight to yeah. be able to pick it. He saw the talent in you and he probably, like, planted the seed in your brain. <laughs> hey, Loz, you grew up in a very different um, neighbourhood, I guess, not in a sporting environment. Your dad was a pop star, Ronnie, Ronnie Burns, and your mum <laughs> was a professional dancer. So how on earth did you get into taekwondo? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I grew up, I used to, you know, we'd go to the local shops and, you know, in the supermarket and women would just come up and, like, fawn over my dad and I just thought that was normal and some of my friends would be like, oh, you know, why is that, why are those women coming up to your dad and, you know, asking for his autograph and all that and the way they'd look at him. But, um, you know, I just was like, oh, that's just absolutely normal and we just had, you know, always camera crews around the house and, you know, mum and dad were always involved in the entertainment industry. But... Um, I went to a school that didn't believe in competitive sport and then, you know, ended up in a full contact martial arts. So it really was a very different, I guess, upbringing. But, you know, really the way I got into Taekwondo was because my brother Mike wanted to be a teenage ninja turtle back in the 80s and um, he just loved doing flying sidekicks off the couch. So he would pile up all the cushions and he would yell and scream for hours and 
always next to his bed he had a ninja headband so he would put that ninja headband on when he woke up in the morning and he'd come out and he'd sit at the kitchen table and we'd say you know what do you want for breakfast Donatello like we had to call him Donatello otherwise he wouldn't answer to us <laughs> and um you know it didn't matter what he actually got for breakfast as long as he sat there going pizza <laughs> you know he pretty much lived the ninja turtles and then one day he did a flying sidekick and he just went straight through the lounge room window and we just heard this hi smash and that was pretty much it for my mum she's like right straight down to the local martial arts center so it could have been anything you know it could have been karate or judo or anything like that but just a couple of streets away was a little taekwondo club at a scout hall he started there and you know taekwondo you can learn at any age so dad started as well and really that's I guess how the family got involved and they always encouraged me to go along and it wasn't until I was about 14 and I think I always thought, oh, if I go down there, would there be anyone my age? Or I was just a bit nervous, but I'd always want to le wanted to learn self-defense. So I went along and, you know, there wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, this is my passion, this is my calling, this is what I'm meant to be doing. It was just like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll come back next week. And I think for a 14-year-old girl, that's pretty good. <laughs> And so after I just, you know, I just kept at it and I just went along every week. And But it wasn't until I went in my first competition that I really developed the passion for it. Now, it's a pretty brutal sport, like, for me, who <laughs> plays a very non-contact sport. Give us a list yeah. of your injuries. I know you've had a few. Give, if you can remember them all, like, give us a list of the worst ones. I actually can't remember them all. I know I've had 13 operations since the Games, just fixing everything up. Oh, no. But, you know, when you fill out this, at the medical centre, you know, you're just like, <laughs> it's not enough space to fill things in. It's like, oh, yeah, so my hand. So which, oh, yeah, that bone, this band, oh, that one. Oh, yeah, and then I had this. So broken bones, you know, bones in my feet. Knees have been the worst. And often some of the, you know, it's often for me, the biggest injuries I got were doing stupid things. So when I was run down or I was tired, I shouldn't have been training, I knew that, I was too tired or too sick and I pushed myself to go along and that's when I, you know, got injured. So, you know, one of the injuries I had was just I, was, I got back from the World Cup and I was really sick and run down and we had Olympic selections coming up and to be considered for, um, for Sydney, I had to be on the floor. So the selectors couldn't mark my notes like, oh, yeah, she's fine <laughs> and, unless I was actually on the floor. So knowing what my history was not enough, I had to be training. So I got on the floor and I was so tired and so sick and I was training with one of the other girls and I got my finger caught in her dobok top and she pulled away really quickly and my finger just smashed <laughs> it was just sticking oh. out like this so just stupid things like that so yeah mainly knees shoulder rico um, broken noses I broke my nose twice in one week just before the games um, I'd never had anything like that happen to me before so um, yeah, there's been a few injuries, but in saying that, you know, some some athletes, you know, rarely have any, but yeah, I have had a lot, but they mainly weren't from what you might expect with a martial art. They weren't from people kicking me and hurting me. They were often just my own fault, my own overtraining or <laughs> pushing myself when I really knew that I shouldn't. So you're really saying you're clumsy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. <laughs> hey, I've got to ask, just on that, what's the worst injury that you've given somebody else? Because, like I said, five foot five, 49, 50 kilos, like, you can pack a punch. Uh, probably. I mean, I always kicked really hard. So, you know, a lot of my teammates would say there's they had a few bruises. But, you know, I received equally the um, same amount from them. But probably in when I was training at that elite level and at international standard and coming back and competing in the Victorian Championships and I had a, a, a it was my first fight at the at VIX and I went out there and I just fought like I normally would. You know, I was just ready like I would at any international and I, I kicked this girl in the head and I knocked her out and it wasn't until that happened that I realised what, you know, that that difference between where I was at and it was actually after that that they stopped and they said okay no more you know the national team doesn't need to compete at the, at the VIX that's for you know getting experience and and for the up-and-comers and you know when you're like in Taekwondo it's about scoring a point so when I was going for that head kick I was going for a point um, and then when she hit the deck I just you know I just felt terrible oh, it's not yeah. a, not a <laughs> 
<laughs> but you can't just put someone, you know, you need to have people more evenly matched. Of course, of course. Sarah, how about your body? Like you've obviously retired a bit, you know, not that long ago. Uh, you've got a couple of kids now. I've got a beautiful photo actually of you that I found today. I think if Luke can just pop that up and it really goes to show how us women can do it all. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> bit of multitasking there. <laughs> yeah, a bit of multitasking, but how's your body in retirement now? Um, I'm really fortunate, actually. Um, I didn't really sustain too I mean, I had a number of crashes, of course, but um, mostly my body's held up really well. Um, so, um, yeah, very fortunate. And so you're, you're ready to start another sport now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I've been doing a few little runs here and there, um, but that, that's I can't do too much because, yeah, the body, you know, just I'm hitting 40 later on this year, so. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so when you, Sarah, when you first um, qualified for, for Athens and you're in a team of three women racing that day for Australia and you're in a team yet you're individuals um, and only one person can win, how does that work? Yeah, it definitely is a, um, a unique situation uh, and you learn it early when you start cycling that um, cycling is very much a team sport. It doesn't happen um, without working together as a team, um, especially because of the, the aerodynamics, the slipstreaming that, that happens in the racing. So you can save up to 30% of your energy when you sit closely behind someone's wheel. So with that in mind, um, sometimes we have in a race what we call the P. So they're sort of like the P in the pod and are protected by the rest of the team. Um, so some races you go into with that where the person is the P and everyone else will look after that person, will do whatever they need to do to make sure that the only effort um, that that P expends will be when they need to, you know, make that break for the for the winning move or for the final sprint. Um, but in Athens, um, the three of us, Anoni Wood, Olivia Gollan and myself, um, we were all quite strong. Um, Anoni was probably um, the more favoured rider out of the three of us uh, because she's such a strong sprinter and of her world standing. She was winning the World Cup that year. Um, but we'd had a, quite a bit of experience um, between us um, over the years. And so going into that race, we were definitely a strong team. So that was more of our plan was to go in and use the numbers um, to put Australia in the best position. So. Um, in that instance, um, what happened in Athens was that um, there was a breakaway of seven riders and um, Anoni, um, my teammate, was in that break and there was six other individual riders from different countries. So to achieve our goal of having the numbers to put Australia in the box seat, we needed to have another Australian go across to that break. So that would mean we'd have two Australians and then six um, different representations of different countries. So one of my real strong points um, on the bike was my technical ability. Um, I was able to corner and descend really fast. So um, down one of the descents, I went you know as fast as I could and I opened up a gap and I was able to bridge across to that leading group solo. So that was a perfect um, uh, tactic, I suppose, in that I didn't bring any other riders across. And then once I got to that leading group and only I were able to have a quick chat. And I guess in that instance, without sort of going into too much um, of the long tactical details, because um, Anoni was a strong sprinter, we could either, two of the main choices was to either for me, um, uh, just stay with Anoni and protect her and then lead her out for the sprint. Um, but that would be putting sort of all our eggs in one basket. So we decided to, um, for me to go away so if I then went away, that would force the other riders in that leading group to then use up their energy to chase me and Anoni could save her legs um, so that if I did get caught, I could then change my tact and work for her um, and be her lead out person um, for the final. Uh, so I went away, uh, did get away solo and then the amazing Judith Art from Germany did bridge across and I remember the moment that she made contact with me was at the bottom of the climb the main climb in the race. It was a two kilometre climb. And I was already so spent after being away solo for a little bit. 
um, that I thought, oh, I'm absolutely done for. I don't know how I'm going to get up this climb. But, you know, these are the moments, you know, with all those years leading up that we prepare for. Um, we'd gone actually over the course the year beforehand and I had um, visualised so many different scenarios, you know, for every um, uh, session that we had intervals. So in that instance, I was able to, I was drawing on everything that I had to to get up that climb. And we we got over the climb together. And um, the, main, the main group behind didn't catch us. So leading into then the final, um, it was gonna be between Judith and I. Um, and I was able to out sprint her at the finish. And then Anoni was um, contesting the sprint then for bronze um, in that leading group that was still there um, in front of the main group. And um, she ended up uh, fourth. So it was a fantastic day for Australia, um, but it certainly wouldn't have happened without the, the team tactics that were involved to get Australia in that, that first position. Such an incredible story, such an um, unselfish um, race tactic, isn't it? Because in a way, you, the, the plan was to get her out there, but it didn't work out because you and Judith were so strong and then you just, you know, you out outlegged her at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess like every um, a different, you know, sporting um, uh, situation, you have to think on your feet and you have to try mm. and, um, you know, go with that instinct with what's right at the time um, to, yeah, make that make that result come forth so um did you did you have those thoughts the night before like i'm curious what were you kind of thinking about the night before did you sleep very much did you picture yourself helping her or you standing on the the top of the podium what were you thinking about i know that's a tricky thing because i mean i had to picture myself um winning because that is a scenario but i also had to picture myself you know being in that position to help australia win whether that was going to be a noni or olivia so there's so many different um yeah visualizations to have to to make that that happen it's not like some of the other individual sports where it's just you um going for the goal there are so many other um, facets involved with that so yeah i did i visualized it all and, I, and obviously had to make sure that I visualised myself up there because if when it came crunch time, um, you know I didn't want to let my teammates down, and mm. also I didn't want to leave my let myself down, and also all the other support that I'd received from you know my family, my mum and dad, and my brothers, and you know all the support that I'd had leading up as well. Mm. So do you, do you kind of share that medal with the other two girls? Does it feel like like that they they almost have a little piece of that medal that you want to give them a chip of it, cut it in half, cut it in thirds? Yeah, I know it's really tricky. Um, we we celebrated together after the race. Um, back then, I I wasn't, um, you know, I could have been better at, at sharing. I didn't know how to. Um, I was almost felt bad that I had won, and you know, I wanted them to experience what I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, so I did what I could and. Um, in helping them be a part of that. And of course they were a part of it in the race. Um, yeah. So yeah, a beautiful moment to share together. I mean, I can't believe uh, what 2004, it's, it's 16 years ago, yeah, 16 yeah, years we ago. Talk, we won't talk about years, we won't talk about years. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, Lauren, thanks for sitting there patiently. It's an amazing story, Sarah, thank That's you. All right. That's just um, amazing. I can't imagine that scenario. It's so, so different to an individual sport so yeah well exactly and for you it's all about you I mean you have a team of people all different um weight divisions and you know you've got all your coaching staff and everyone and I know that going into Sydney you were ranked number three in the world is that right the same as Natalie and I were um and we we got to yeah. know each other just before Sydney do you remember where we got to know each other can you remind us of that story yeah, so we are at the uh, Australian Ladies Masters and um, I'll never forget because it was just, you know, I was invited to go along and I was like, oh, yeah, they just want, you know, female sports people or whatever. And then, yeah, to meet you and, and Matt and all the other people that were there. But I do remember because we were on a team and um, <laughs> we were obviously, we weren't so good at golf, but Nat was amazing. And um, and what was the professional golfer? Um Laura, what was her Laura name? Davey. Anyway, Laura Davies. Sorry? Laura Davies. Yes, that's right. So she was, she was uh, head of our team. And um, so we were going around and we were kind of, you know, driving the buggy, <laughs> having a few laughs. But, yeah, it was just um, on that final part and Nat was about to take this shot and uh, she was would have been, you know, quite a few, what, like 
10 metres away or something. And she's like, if I get this in, we're all going to win a gold medal. And so she just took the shot. And I was like, I can still remember that ball going towards that hole. And then it just popped in and we were just all like, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I think and well. so it was, you know, like, that's a great moment. And, of course, there's other things in your life at that point where you're like, yeah, I'm going to win. And it's all that lead up and that sort of affirmation, you know, leading into the games. But... Then to be at the village and to see you guys and watch you guys at Bondi and then to win a couple of days later and to have shared that journey and, you know, our friendship from that time and then to both, you know, win, you know, gold medals was just amazing. This is such a beautiful thing to be an Olympian because you do become part of the Olympic family and we're always Olympians. We're not ex-Olympians or former Olympians. We're Olympians forever and we have this amazing family. And I remember watching you win. So we won on the 25th, you won on the 27th, two days. And we, we came in the village on the 26th and we found you kind of sweating yeah. off the last couple of kilos. Tell us. I remember <laughs> in the dining hall. When you found out that you had to, like, go down <laughs> and wait, yeah. What, it was either 54 kilos or 49 kilos that you were going to go in. Is that right? Yeah, so I fought in the women's under 49 kilos at Sydney and that's an Olympic weight division. So normally I used to fight in under 51. Okay. So, yeah, there's normally eight weight divisions and so for the games there's only four. And I 51 was always tricky for me to get into and I could do that safely. I'd done it for years. I knew what to do. I would sit, you know, just above that. I was probably sit at 55 naturally and then 53 at a training weight and just drop in. So it still was quite a bit of work for me to get to 51 but 49 was a completely different completely different strategy and I knew from experience you know I was very experienced by that point I'd done a lot of you know cutting weight and I knew that I didn't want to you know sweat sauna run it off you know put all the gear on I'd done that many times you know found myself in you know hotel you know car parks <laughs> skipping it off and what I found was that you just don't have the clarity and the decision making time if you um, if you sweat weight off like that. So, you know, also it doesn't help you to tapering. So you plan this incredible taper so that you're like, you know, you've got everything firing and you're really sharp. And then if you leave it to chance, you've got half a kilo or a kilo to get off um, and you've got to get that weight off somehow, it can be really detrimental. And what I found was it wasn't always the first fight, but often it was the last. So, you know, you get yourself into the final and then you just can't think straight. And, you know, Taekwondo is such a strategic game. It's all about strategy. And if you can't make changes and, you know, split second decisions, then you know, you're cooked. So for me to get to 49, I wanted to make sure I did it and I had strength and power and you know, clarity and I wasn't really dehydrated. So it took me about three months. So I practiced it beforehand and I did some, there was one in Italy where I just, I could not get it off. It was about two years before the games and I just could not get it off. And I was in that position where I had to just sweat it off. And I'd fought this girl at the Belgium Open a week before and absolutely smashed her. Like it was some huge score, like 14-1 or something like that. And get to this Italian Open and you know, I'm trying to get the weight off, I can't get it off. I meet the same girl in the final and she just absolutely <laughs> annihilates me. And I know that it was because I just didn't have that ability to, I didn't have the strength and the stamina, I was fatiguing, I couldn't make those decisions. So I didn't want that to happen at the game. So it took, yeah, it took about three months and it was all about, you know, making sure I was eating, you know, a variety, you know, eating the rainbow, lots of fruit and veg, heaps and heaps and heaps of different coloured vegetables. Um, I was vegetarian, so I was having different protein and beans and legumes and eggs and avocados and all different oils and, like, I really, it was such a science for me to make sure that I was getting the right nutrition and also I was doing what was right for my body. So, because I'd been doing it for so long, I really knew what, what worked and what didn't. Mm -hmm. And so going into the games, like I was walking 12K a day at the village. So I would just, yeah. you know, walk. I had to make sure I was walking a lot because I didn't want to load up my legs with any running or any more training than I was already doing. So, and I just felt like, you know, I was on fire at the games and I, I'd practiced that taper so many times and I knew what I needed. And it wasn't the same as everyone else on the team and it certainly wasn't the same as what my coach probably would have preferred. Um, but he let me go with it because we practised it and he knew that that really worked for me. So I felt like I was just like 
you know, it was like a rubber band. I was just, I felt so fast and so sharp on that day. Oh, I just saw your face there. You're just like, oh, I remember seeing you, seeing you compete for the first time and what I was so astounded by was the noise that you make when you do a kick or a punch. Can you, can you can like... You see the, you can I? see the thing on my finger there. That's where I broke my finger. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the noise. A noise demo? Oh, my God. It's so <laughs> hard, like, now without doing it. But we, it's just like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> but I, remember when my, I remember when my housemate at the time came and watched training and I was like, you've got to come down. And she's like, oh, my God, you guys, just the whole time. It's just like, ah, 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 you know, because it's so much a part of training. Every yeah. session, just boys, movement, everything we're doing. And, you know, it does make a big difference even with, presence in the ring so you know for example when I when I fought Chinese Taipei so Chinese Taipei was my absolute nemesis and she was incredible she's one of the most amazing athletes I've ever you know had the pleasure of fighting in the ring um, and we were so evenly matched and I'd lost to her just in the last one second at the Worlds the year before and when I came out and stepped into the ring and they started the match with her and I just did this movement like you know and she just, she didn't even move. She didn't even flinch. Whereas when I did the same thing to Cuba in the final, as soon as I did that move, you know, she went like that. And that's for me when I was like, I've got you. It was right at the beginning <laughs> of the match. It was a very, very slight thing. So that showmanship of being in the ring and the, the way that you move. And, you know, when I did that to Taipei, she was looking straight back at me like, Hey, is that all you got? So, you know, I knew that we were on. That was on. And that was by far the hardest fight that I had on that day. Hey, Cookie, can you move our pictures to this? I want to see that that picture just there with your coach. Um, he's yeah. doing up your helmet. Yeah, cool. Um, can you tell us what's going on there? What What do you think he was saying or, yeah, do you remember? Yeah, so he, no. <laughs> he was like that all the time so he would talk to me and he'd often hold me like that like hold my attention but that day I just felt we were so in sync like I I can't really remember what he said because everything he said to me I just knew as well like we were just on the same wavelength so I just remembered going uh-huh uh-huh yep I've got that I've got it I've got it and I just everything was really congruent and you know, we knew each other so well, he could pretty much just, you know, blink an eye and I would know exactly what he wanted me to do. It was just, there was one fight with um, a girl from Denmark and I kept doing this kick and it was a, a double. It was one to the, bo both to the body. And he just, when I came out, he goes, do the same thing, one to the body, one to the face. And I did that and it worked. And that was the only thing because it was different to what I was already doing. But I felt like we were really, we just, knew everything and then I had my club coach Martin Hall who I could pretty much hear from anywhere in the world if he yelled at now from his house I could hear him and he was yelling from the stand so I could hear what he was saying as well but you know my coach and I Jinte so we had you know we had it was pretty tough when he first came out from Korea there was a lot of things that we had to sort of adjust to each other and we had some pretty big blues and clashed and I feel like because we did that we were very honest with each other and we were able to work through these things so when we stepped on the mat at the games we knew what we were doing like he knew that if I didn't feel comfortable I would say oh no I'm not doing that like give me something else but if I'm like yep okay I'm going to do it he knew I was going to do that so I we felt so comfortable and it was those years of um you know relationships being really real and that's actually what I've found with some of my PhD research is that, you know, these relationships that, you know, athletes have with their coaches or other people on their team, you know, they're, they're really powerful and they're really important in, in performance. Yeah. And you met someone pretty special in the games. Tell us about <laughs> this moment. Yeah, so this, oh, my God. So there wasn't many times that I was, you know, hanging out in the dining hall. But, you know, you can even see from the background there, the dining hall, you know, from it's just massive you guys know what it's like enormous the size of a football field filled with every different type of food you could possibly imagine and so I had pretty I would go in and I was just like I'm going to go find my steamed broccoli and my veggies and 
I was sharing a room with Lisa who was trying to put on weight, so that was terrible. And anyway, I was sitting in the dining hall, I'd finished, and all of a sudden this limo pulls up and out hop all these security guards and, you know, they're roping off an area and we were just thinking, you know, who thinks they need this security in the village? Like, you know, it's so hard to get in there. So who's doing all this, you know? And then out hops Muhammad Ali and the whole dining hall, just, you know, these sea of athletes and coaches and everything just went quiet and just looked at him. And his helpers had just set up a table, roped off an area, and they just said, you know, come up, say hi, have a photo. And, you know, I was one of the first up there because I wasn't eating. <laughs> and so I just sat down next to him and he had the most incredible presence, you know. There was just something about him and... You know, I'd always admired him for his, you know, obviously in the ring, but, you know, his political stance and his sort of, you know, commitment to his own personal beliefs. And I sat down next to him and, yeah, there's that photo and he just put his arm around me and I got the photo. And then Paul, my teammate afterwards, he came out and he goes, oh, my God, you know, you got this winning kiss because he just, you know, pecked me on the cheek. And he goes, that's it, Loz, you're going to win a gold medal. I can tell, you know, winning kiss, <laughs> Muhammad Ali, that's it, you know, writing's on the wall. And I was like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I got a little kiss from Muhammad Ali. And then I turned around and he's just kissing all the other girls. Damn. <laughs> what is he? What a feeling. He was a bit of a charmer. Oh, gosh, how awesome. Sarah, did you have any famous people in Athens or Beijing? No, no, not that um, I can remember. Because um, in Athens, we didn't actually we didn't actually stay in the village um, in Athens. We stayed outside near where our courses were. Um, so we only yeah. And then straight after that, we had to go to France for a World Cup because um, Anoni was winning the World Cup, and so we raced that. And then I came back the morning of the closing ceremony. So no, I don't remember um, meeting anyone. Have I would have. You would have had a good party that night in the closing ceremony, though, after all that. Um, yeah, it was wonderful. I'm pleased that we were able to do that because we weren't able to do the opening ceremony either because our, our race was on the second day. Does it make you feel a little bit like we talked a lot about opening ceremonies last night. Does it make you feel a bit ripped off that you weren't able to do the opening ceremony? Like, did you feel a bit left out? Well, at the time, no, because I was just so focused on the race that it was, well, I'm here to do a job and that is my race and this is how I'm preparing for it. Although, mind you, we were in the hotel room because we weren't in the village um, and we could um, actually, even though we are watching it on TV, we could um, see and hear the fireworks. Wow. So that was, yeah, so that was sort of um, a bit weird when we were we were watching that. But, um, no, I didn't feel, I mean, afterwards when I thought about it, I'm like, oh, man, that would have been good. But at the time, you know, that was the process and that was the plan. So um, you didn't even think about it. Now I want to take you back to your winning moment. So I think we've got a picture of, of your winning moment. Pretty mm -hmm. incredible photo. But there was somebody who's very close to you in the next photo um, who had a, his own little winning moment just after you won. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Yes, that's my dad. Um, he So mum and dad did make it to Athens. They weren't going to and then just three weeks beforehand they decided to go over. Um, so it was wonderful that they were there. And so just after I crossed the finish line, the group of people that he was there with were like, man, you've got to get over there and see her. And so they legged him up over the fence. And then as they legged him over, his leg got caught in the fence. And so then he's come down and his head has hit the pavement and he's got knocked out. And then because he's on the other side of the fence, the security guards are straight onto him and thrown him back over. Um, and, then, and then he tells a story where he comes to because he's knocked out. So I don't know how this is where, how he's got there. Obviously he's walked, I suppose, but he's come to in the train station and he's there looking up at the signs and some of it's obviously in Greek. So he's like, what the hell, where am I? What's happening? And then he's like, recall, oh, I'm in Athens. Oh, the Olympic Games. Oh, Sarah. And then he made his way, he made his way back to the finish line, but everything was all packed up. Um, Mum was wandering around trying to find him. And then it wasn't until really late uh, that night that I, that I found him. And he was all like, there's all blood all over his face and on his leg and he was still like all a bit concussive, <laughs> you know, what's going on. So it was so sad that he missed that moment, but uh, mum was there to see it <laughs> and we could fill him in. So uh, it's a bloody good story though, bloody good story. Hey, listen, yeah, well, <laughs> rapid fire question. So this is our 60 second sprint. So who wants to go first? Hands up if you want to go first. 
You're the power <laughs> athlete, Lauren. Go for it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, Lauren, you're first. Okay. Did you sleep before the final, the night before? Yes. Good. Uh, did you have an Olympic romance? Well, partner on the team, yes. Oh. <laughs> um, do you still play taekwondo? No, boxing now. Ah. Combat sport. What is <laughs> your unique superpower while you're playing? Um, Self-belief. Awesome. I love that. I was expecting some kick or something. Uh, <laughs> oh, what, I did, yeah. What's your favourite piece of memorabilia? Oh, my gold medal. Yeah. <laughs> Would you? Uh, here's a good one. If you're in a team sport, well, you know, all playing together at the same time, would you rather be the worst player in the best team or the best player in the worst team? Best player. Oh. Is your medal still in mint condition? No, it's, it's very tarnished and worn and that's because I take it everywhere to all my speaking engagements and I love it now even more because of that. Awesome. That's cool. Where do you keep it? <laughs> you don't have to tell us, but... If you just want. around, well, it has it hasn't been going out quite as much, obviously because of COVID. <laughs> but normally it's just somewhere handy that I can grab it and take it out, and you know, I just I seriously, I mean, you know, what guys know what it's like. Just having someone when you hand it out and people get it in their hands and they just have that special moment of holding a gold medal. I just I I love that so much that I, I'll always take it out. Yeah, and sometimes you go. I wonder where my medal is. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I remember being in a bar in Sydney not long after we finished and um, all of a sudden I thought, where's my medal? And some guy, I didn't even know who he was, walked back up and said, here's your medal. I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh. I often have that. Or I'm at a speech engagement I'm like, okay, I'm done, see you later, say bye to everyone, and then someone comes, you know, do you need this? It's like, oh, yeah, no, I definitely need that. <laughs> How about you, Sarah? Before we do your 60-second sprint, where's your medal? Just at home. Yeah. Just at home, hanging around. Do you use it at lot? Do you take it out with you? Does it? Yes. Yeah. We'd, I definitely take it out. And it got so tarnished um, because of the oils in people's hands, it started to eat away at the protective coating. So I did actually get the sash unpicked to get it recoated. Um, oh. And um, so now, actually, I haven't had the sash restitched. So it's actually stitched together back with a pin, <laughs> even though it's looking shiny and gold again. <laughs> um, yeah. It's... Maybe that's what we need to do, Kez. I need to get it. It just makes me very. You're very thrifty. Putting to putting it back together with a pin. Oh, <laughs> Such a um. Such a All right, your sixty seconds starts now. What's your favourite Olympic moment apart from your own? Michael Johnson in the he's in the one hundred or oh, the two hundred four hundred meter athletics track. Amazing. Would you trade your gold medal for anything? Oh. Um. Um, not that I can think of right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you could do it all over again but in a different sport, what sport would it be? Uh, maybe tennis. I love tennis. Oh, cool. Have you got an Olympic tattoo? No. Did you want to get one? Yes, I thought about it, um, but I don't have any. What would you have got, the rings or just something? Yeah. To I thought about getting um, the uh, Athens written in Greek and then Beijing written in Chinese with the with the rings, but I didn't. Ah, amazing! Best part: the thrill of the win or the moment the medal was placed around your neck. Thrill of the win. And what was your superpower? Uh, I think my mental strength. Very cool. You both said that. Very very cool. And it just goes to show, I mean, obviously we all speak about it a lot, the difference between, you know, gold and silver or gold and just competing. It's all about the mental strength, isn't it? So cool, so cool. Amazing. Well, Luke, have we got any questions there that we want to um, ask the girls? Do you want to pick a couple? And Yeah, we've got a couple. Uh, let me just start with the first one. I'll just start with the last one. Um, Megan's asked for you, Lauren, um, does veganism impact how people perform in the games due to having to find different sources of protein rather than the traditional sources like meat? 
Um, so I wasn't vegan, I was vegetarian. So I still had eggs and sure. dairy and cheese, that sort of thing. I think you can do it safely, but you really need assistance. So I use the dietitian at the VIS. And, you know, back then they didn't know a lot about some of the things that I was eating. Uh, seaweeds and miso and all these different you know things that I was having um, but I think having a team of people so I had a naturopath I worked with another nutritionist and then I had the dietitian so regular skin folds I checked bone density so you know it's, and I think this is whether or not you have a plant-based diet or you eat meat I think that's actually really important to make sure you're getting um, the energy requirements you're getting the nourishment like I used to notice when I'd start dropping weight and I wasn't doing it very well I was you know my skin would get really dry my hair my nails so you know then I'd add in in more you know really good quality fats and oils and avocados and nuts and seeds and all that sort of thing but I think probably with diet one of the main things is being really organized because you know training is hard it's intense it often takes up a you know big chunks of your day most athletes especially my, most Olympic athletes are working as well so you have to be really organized so that you've got good quality snacks right there. So straight after training, you've got something um, and not just filling up on sort of, you know, um, you know, refined carbs and just eating whatever that you can get your hands on. Because often, you know, you, I found when I was training, I was really hungry All like I just really needed a lot. Um, and so I would just make up batches and I'd have things cooked in the fridge and I would have things ready in my training bag. And then also with timing. So I'd have, you know, soup in the evening, um, after training because I wouldn't get home till really late, you know, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock sometimes. So, you know, I'd have my main meal in the middle of the day. So, yeah, I think really it can be, um, it's up to the individual, but I would definitely recommend doing it with a team of people and really having a strategy and, and having some monitoring systems around it. Well, don't come here to the virtual cafe because our bacon and egg roll, it's incredible. <laughs> well, you know, hey, we're talking a lot sport here. If you're a, you know... <laughs> High oil machine, you really want to put the best fuel in. Sarah, Sarah I've got one for you. Um, and this sort of, you sort of answered this in your previous comments earlier, but um, outside of the race, how does it feel then feel to go away without being the winner, even though your team technically won? <laughs> have you been on the flip side of those moments? And how have you felt in those moments? I actually remember my first race um, that I was racing elite and I was, um, my job was to work for uh, the person that was going to win the World Cup. Her name was Anna Wilson. And um, I was only 18 at the time. And it was amazing. I felt like I'd won the race, even though I'd come in minutes after the, the rider had actually run, won, as Anna actually won the race. Um, it just felt like we'd won ourselves as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a different thing, I suppose, different concept. It was a difficult thing to explain to mum and dad and other people that aren't involved in cycling. I mean, how can you sweat out hours and hours uh, and then put yourself on the line for someone else? It sounds weird, like why would you do that? But it's something that you learn when you're a part of the sport. And, yeah, um, it's teamwork, right? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it would be, it'd be really interesting if you um, add this concept to other teams, so let's say, you know, football, netball, hockey, whatever it might be, um, if the person who scored the most goals or the most tries or the most points was the only person to stand on the podium, you know, mm. how that team dynamic may change. Is it a true, authentic, you know, team dynamic that's that's taking place because you know essentially that's what happens with the cycling so um it does take um you know years i suppose uh, for teams to come together and have that really nice dynamic together and that teamwork and and the communication to to make it happen so good now i've got a great question for you lauren from harry uh combat sport in australia has a really small pool compared to other countries around the world how did you remain competitive internationally? Did you travel overseas or you managed with minimal sparring partners in Oz? We travelled heaps and we, I mean, heaps. Right. <laughs> so for us, you know, we'd go to Korea and every high school you went to, every university, they've got martial arts unis. Like it's just the the depth there is unbelievable like in victoria every kid can kick a footy you know um and it's like that in in korea it's just amazing so we would go over there and we'd often spend a month or you know extended periods of time and we would just have these training camps and we'd go to these high schools and unis and we just it was like just drilling like as many sparring partners as we could have and you know they were world championship level at you know the high school 
So, yeah, that was really important. We travelled to Europe, like if we do a European tour, we'd go to all the Opens and then we'd go and train like in Spain at the Institute there. They were, you know, one of the world leaders at the time. They had incredible facilities and really state-of-the-art knowledge about sports science with Taekwondo. So that was incredible. And then as we got closer to the games, we started to bring training partners out to us. So, and even during the games, we... We went into the village and packed, you know, got set up all our stuff, and then we actually went out to the AIS, which we were just, we really didn't want to do at the time, the athletes. But our coaches actually made the right decision. So when we got out, um, we had training partners there from France, and we were, and we had our, you know, other team, uh, shadow team, and other, you know, Australian players there. But yeah, really, you, you need to get that international experience because we just don't have that depth here, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, I'm going to open this question out to both of you, even though I was asked just for Lauren. Caroline's asked, how has winning an Olympic gold medal shaped you as a person? Um, I'll kick off with you, Sarah. Shaped me as a person? Yeah, has it, has um, it done anything since you've won? Like... I think it's helped me to be more open. I was really shy when I was younger. So um, having after having won, it forced me to be... Um, yeah, just be more open and to, um, I guess, share the experience that I had. I mean, I mentioned earlier on that, you know, I would have done, you know, done things differently with how I shared it with my teammates. And over the last few you know, years since I've won, I've been better at sharing my experiences with different people as well and sharing my emotions and sharing my feelings about how it all was for me and sharing my journey. Um, so um, I think if um, I hadn't have won, I'm sure I would be a lot um shyer or kept, would have stayed in that shy realm <laughs> uh, you know still I, I you know i have my shy moments um but i force myself to to be more open and um yeah talkative beautiful and lauren you uh i think it's hard to know what i would have i mean i feel like what i got out of you know winning a gold medal also i got out of sport and i think that all of the lessons and all of the skills that I learned along the way, you know, planning, resilience, you know, just looking at the big picture, self-belief, determination, all those things. Um, I think, I mean, I, I would have got those anyway without winning, but the, winning the gold medal really was the icing on the cake. And I apply a lot of those aspects to all areas of my life. I mean, now um, the PhD that I'm doing, and I'm really finishing up, I've been doing it for five years, it's just, it is a test in resilience. And I think there's so many parallels with sport in other things I've done with business or, you know, writing books or whatever. I just feel like I've those skills that I learned in sport have really just transferred over into so many other areas of life. Fantastic. Kerry, I would echo that you? too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, guys, we've got to wrap it up. I wish we could talk for another hour. It just goes so quickly. Um, thank you so much to both of you beautiful women to share for sharing your journey. Thanks again, Luke, for having us here in the Cup of Life. Thanks to Nikki Gassett and Jill Kovitz and, of course, um, Charlie DeGene, who helps with our videos and everything. It's a teamwork. It's really a team, this, the, the athlete story. So thank you guys so much. I'm going to leave you with a bit of positivity, positivity and say that positivity is like a boomerang. The more you put it out there, the more it comes back. So keep smiling, everyone. And um, oh, hand it over back to you, Luke, to close us out. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, click in the office area right now and please do make a donation for the Australian Sports Foundation. A lot of clubs are struggling since COVID, 16,000 of them. And... and um, you know, these are future Olympians that are going to be coming through. So, um, yeah, 16,000 clubs could go under in the next six months if we don't support or at least build awareness, which is why we're doing this whole series is to help support them. So thank you, everyone, for again joining us in the Cup of Life Cafe. We'll see you tomorrow. Wow, big one, hey? Doing big one, Warren. Dawn Fraser and Ian Thorpe in the house. Come wow. on, big <laughs> girls. Um, thank you so much again, Lauren and Sarah, for joining us, and we'll catch everyone soon. We'll say our goodbyes. Please put a wave of Thanks, gratitude guys. in the in the in the chat room, and we'll see everyone tomorrow night. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.